Hello, welcome to Lab Talk Radio. Today's topic is going to be spirituality, technology, and philosophy, and we have Stuart Alsop here with us, and he is the host of the Crazy Wisdom podcast. Stuart, how are you? I'm so good. Thank you so much for having me, Michelle. You're welcome. Stuart, what is your story? So that's a good question, and I could come up about it from a couple different angles. You know, we all have stories about what is happening right now. Like both of us have a story about what is happening right now and they might be slightly different, but a lot of times they agree. Uh, but what is my story in general? Uh, so I guess it depends on the context we wanna, know, we wanna know about. I can give you a quick understanding about like what the Crazy Wisdom Podcast is because uh, that's what you mentioned in my title. So I, about three years ago, I was going through a really intense, stressful medical challenge, and, uh, and I was going through a lot of stress, and people had always kind of told me that I was creative. And so I wanted to understand what the relationship is between stress and creativity. And so I started to interview people about that question, and I actually interviewed you for one of my first interviews. So, uh, and then I've been doing that now for three years, and it's going really well. Um, and I've uh, gone from doing mostly in-person interviews to now doing mostly remote interviews, and then COVID just kind of blew that out of the water. So uh, it's really interesting because we've got this thing called the global internet culture that is arising. Um, and it's and it's like, if you go back like 200 years ago, you hear about people like Albert Einstein, he wasn't 200 years ago, but he was part of that same group. You hear them talking about this global transnational culture. Uh, and it seems like the internet is now making that possible, uh, which is really interesting. But then it's also creating a lot of other crazy problems that um, are, are happening right now too. What is the relationship between creativity and stress? Well, again, it depends on the context. So, so we can talk about stress from many different uh, angles. We can talk about gravity as a form of stress that, uh, that basically has incentivized our bodies to be in a particular way. And so there's the stress of gravity that's interacting on both of us right now. Um, and that's like, just like a p physical stress. Uh, but then you've got emotional stress or some might even say spiritual stress. Uh, and so Emotional stress could be having a difficult relationship with your boss or having an uncomfortable conversation. Um, and then you've got the other side, which is creativity. And it's funny because the word creativity used to only be referred to when talking about God. Uh, and then in the first, the first time that it was used in the human sense was in the 17th century by a, a Polish poet who talked, started to talk about creativity in a different way. And then, so it's only had a couple hundred years of, of kind of, uh, of definitions as it relates to human beings and human beings able to create. Previously, God was the only one who could create. And so those, you got those two things and how are they related? And, and that depends on the person. So, so for me, my personal way of managing stress is to manage the, the heck out of it. And then basically, because um, uh, if I get too much stress at one time, I kind of shut down. And so I've had to learn how to manage my stress as opposed to a lot of other people who can essentially let stress be the motivator. Um, in some ways, I've been able to do that as well. I had an interesting podcast about um, uh, uh, where a guest mentioned The Upside of Stress, which is a really good book that talks about the relationship uh, in a way that most people don't get, which is that if we view stress as a disease, our bodies, our immune systems essentially shut down. But if we view stress as a challenge, uh, and we, we view that we have the capacity to d work with stress, we can actually, uh, it can actually motivate us to do all these really important and influential things. Awesome. What is the opposite of stress? Mm. Mm. That's a really good question. Mm. So, could be relaxation. Seems like a release of tension has to do with it. What do you think? Me personally, maybe calm. But I still like that just might be too easy <laughs> because when you're calm, you're at a state where you're focused on the present and you don't need to focus. You can just be versus when you're stressful and it depends on everyone or the person, then I assume that you could be thinking about the past or the future so there's what? some anxiety yeah. and if you are emotional emotionally stressed you could you may not be worried or anxious about the future but something is bothering your mind so in that aspect you are not calm i, I like that a lot and 
when it reminds me of there's a Sanskrit word called Ananda and the other the, the and Ananda means bliss or it's sometimes translated as bliss or joy but and then there's Nanda in Sanskrit which means conditioned joy mm -hmm. and so Ananda means essentially unconditioned joy and what you're talking about in that calm state seems like that's what you're talking about is just like these things can happen to us that are very stressful, but depending on our level of peace and calm and tranquility, we can work with them and essentially, well, we can be unaffected by them mm -hmm. uh, because the, the, there's like, there's a part of us that is being and is aware all the time. That's just like constantly aware. Mm -hmm. Any thought that I have, I can be aware of that thought, any emotion I have, I can be aware of that emotion. And any bo any bodily sensation, I can I can be aware of that. But it, and under according to my investigation, if I can be aware of all these things as a witness and being witnessing of them, then I am not those things either. Um, then I'm not just those things. Does that make sense? It, it does. It's, it, and and I was re reminded of just two concepts, both freedom and letting go. It's probably developed or progress, progression. If you have a, a traffic ticket, you get stressed. Oh my gosh, I have to pay 200 or 500 bucks. And it just ruins your day. But now, not in wood. Yeah. You know, when stuff like that happened, I just let go. It really doesn't impact my day anymore. I just basically pay the amount. I really didn't really know what happened, but I think it's really maybe conditioned to mine. It, it's your perception. And as I learned personally to let go of certain things that I just don't allow them to bother me that much. And so I'm free of, of that stress. Um, I think there's a book called Letting Go that I read, and right. it's I'm actually reading the same right cousin as forgiveness. If someone does something bad to you and you forgive them, in a sense, you're free of that. I'm reading that book right now, Letting Go by uh, oh, awesome. Hawkins. Uh, <laughs> I don't know the author, but I did. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I just bought it on Amazon oh, yeah. one day. And it's just kind of free you from everything. And, and you know, there, there's things that you can control and there's things you cannot. And, you know, and such is life. And you mentioned back when we were first talking a few minutes ago about the future and the past and how a lot of times we are stressed when we are thinking about the future and past. And I think the stress comes not from thinking about the future and past, but from having expectations of the future that don't, aren't met right now. And then also of thinking of things that happened in the past, but, no, but not recognizing that our stories of the past are not the past itself. And so I think it has a lot to do with expectation and beliefs in our own experiences of things. But like, even if I ask myself the question right now, what is real? there's very, very few things that will be like, oh, I know that for sure that that is real. You know, I've got my sensations in my body. I know that those are happening as sensations in the body, but I can't really say, oh, my sensations in my stomach are because of this, because that's just like a story that I place on the sensation, which might or might not be that thing. So I think the stress comes from our thinking that we are way, way more powerful or controlling or able to control things that we can't really control. Yeah, and I'm thinking about Pia Melody for some reason. She wrote a book called The Intimacy Factor. <laughs> Hopefully I got the author right. It's not a philosophy book, but more of a psychology book. I always find the relationship between spiritual spirituality, philosophy, even technology, and psychology. I think a lot of these concepts relate to each other. In these books, they talk about the relationship between reality and perception. Because if you hurt me, is my perception of me being hurt. Mm -hmm. That reality may or may not be real. And it's my perception of, of it of being hurt by you. However, I think on the flip side of it though, I don't want to discredit mm -hmm. that reality or how I perceive things because then you have the psychopaths and the sociopaths. <laughs> and gaslighting because there are certain things that are real and we don't want to invalidate a person's reality in that sense right it's really important not to go into spiritual bypassing <laughs>
and like yeah saying things exi- don't exist when they exist but at the same time then it's like at a certain level like you're saying you can let, let go of most of these traumas and painful but i don't think you can force anyone else to and that's 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 the challenge i think because when, when somebody comes to me or comes to somebody and says i have been hurt by this action from this person i think there's judgment which would be saying no you're wrong uh, uh, or there's discernment which is saying oh yes that your perception of that thing happening uh, that happened uh, but then but what about this what about this like this 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 looking at it in this way or you know like putting some nuance cuz life seems to be infinitely nuanced and complex uh, and just like not our stories are really good for talking about things and communicating i can i can communicate this story about what's going on in my life to you and you can under we can have this shared understanding but then the stories themselves aren't can't fully encompass what reality is reality gets very non-linear all the time but then we have this linear consciousness or linear way of viewing the world as in this one thing um, as this one unitary thing that's happening but that's just like a simulation that our brain is playing uh, which is really crazy so. <sighs> all right let's move into technology a little bit Cool. <laughs> Since, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what are some technology that excites you? Well, it excites excites me and scares. So we can talk about stress more. So there's there's being scared, uh, and then there's excitement. There's anxiety and excitement, and both of those things are related. So I'm both anxious and excited about uh, GPT four, uh, which is general predictive text. Uh, number four, they've just started to release three and it is blowing my mind the level of, of ability for these people to be, or for, for the computer to sound like it's a human being and like a very cogent sound, sounding human being that actually at like, whoa. Uh, so that, yeah, scares me because writing, I think the profession of writing is about to change drastically. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so that's a big one. And then an, another technology that I'm finding that I want to use for my, for my podcast. Uh, I want to start doing invite only podcasts. You might actually like this as well. I want to basically create a token. I've already created the token. And then I want to, for people to listen to the podcast, they need to have that token. And, uh, and so kind of create a, a, a private network for, for, for podcasting as well. And then um, internet Wi-Fi mesh networks are, is something I've had to recently learn about uh, a lot about because I'm now living on some land in the countryside uh, and internet is a very, very big challenge. And there's actually a cryptocurrency that's doing internet sharing uh, or there's a cryptocurrency company you might know about it already. So, but those are, yeah, those are a few technologies I'm pretty interested in. Yeah, I like, I like mesh network. I think, I think it's awesome. I think if it's executed and implemented, I think it will base, it will provide internet to a lot of places, not just to the place where you're living right now, but to other countries as well. It needs a lot of collaboration within human beings too. It needs a network. So I'm hoping that people will like more people will learn about it so that it becomes a reality. Well, that's the, that's the, that's the, that's the point right there is that you need a lot of people in the network. But then the cool thing is, is you can also do profit sharing in a way that like an ISP can't do profit sharing, like to make each so that I can have my own internet here on the land, but then I can also beam it to the neighbors and get paid for that internet as well. So I think that's, that's pretty, it's a pretty good, um, uh, it's a pretty good incentive for people to, to jump on the network if you can have your internet and then get paid for it as well. I'm excited to see the next generation of the internet where it's faster, remote and distributed, it incentivizes, and it's powerful and fast as well. That would be awesome. Mm. I've got a question just came to me. Does, does information inherently want to be free? Because we had this first wave of the internet that happened in the 80s and 90s and the people who created it envisioned a world that was information was free accessible and that's happened but then because of the problem that you mentioned which is the isps the internet service providers are essentially monopolies or oligopolies they they control it now to a degree and can enforce access or uh, or limit access and then you've got the interaction between them and the government and the government in a lot of places particularly in china can pull has already fully separated the Chinese internet from the rest of the internet. Um, but then what you just mentioned about the mesh network might be that second wave of the internet 
which might very well be free. So it's like, there's a value that I have that I want information to be free because I think it's really scary to, for censorship and all these other things. Information is free, but it has a price. Mm-hmm. that you have a bunch of companies that are controlling the internet in terms of access, but you also have a bunch of companies that are controlling ad. In a way, it is free and it's not free. I'm hoping that distributed systems will be controlled by the people, not just access to the internet, but also what you will see and your advertisements. If they're distributed, would they be better? And can you control those privacy and having it centralized, not centralized in the sense of one company, but centralized in the sense of the person. So it's more identity-based, it's more person-based, and and hopefully that will provide more freedom to us in that sense. If that information is shared and controlled by me or you or, or each person to allow what we will see, I think that's a lot better than have it controlled by a few companies. This is a really interesting question about identity, and so we've uh, I can't you know we've always like every culture always names each of their children. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I have a name, and that's Stuart, and you have a name, and that's Michelle. And that was the first instance of being like, okay, there's this body. What are we going to call this body? The body mind. What are we going to call this body mind? And that was that was the name, and each culture has a name. And then at some point along the line. I think it was probably in the 1920s, we also got a phone number. But first the phone number was for a house and now each individual has a phone number. So they have a phone number and they've got a name uh, and then they've got a whole bunch of other, now they've got a Facebook profile uh, and then they got a Twitter profile. Uh, and so it's like, we have this identity and this identity is marked by some sort of abstract thing. And then I've seen a lot of crypto projects talk about then also assigning, I guess it's a wallet. I guess the wallet is your, is, but that's, you can have many, many wallets, you know, and then you got a social security number and all these different things. What do you, what do you think is in that identity is going to happen? What do you think? Where, where are we going to go with that? Yeah. So my, my vision is, is that I, I think the true vision of Bitcoin or cryptocurrency is peer to peer, which I'm really, really big about. I think banks will be gone in the future. Instead, I think each one of us will have a wallet, just like just like a cell phone. You know, each one of us have a cell phone or wallet. But more than that, though, I think we will have our own cryptocurrency and our own coin, just like you mentioned. And I'll have some steward coin or crazy with some co- tokens if i wanted to listen to it i'll send you one or two for example i make 3d jewelry earrings possibly i'll have a token for that we can trade you can send me some coins for my 3d jewelry because i make rings for men too as well as pendants so you'll give me some of your crazy wisdom podcast coin and i'll use your crazy puck wisdom podcast coin and i'll listen to one or two of your episode <laughs> And as that trading between people, why do we need a, the bank? They basically control a lot of things. We pay fees, we pay late fees, we pay fees for receiving money, sending money. It takes them three days if we wanted to transfer money. Even if you sell a stock, you have to wait a few days in order to receive the money. And if you wanted to wire money to some, someone in Europe, you have to also pay a fee. Why do we need to do that? It's such, it constructed in a different way yeah. where we're so dependent on these entities to trade and conduct and that, business. Well, and that's the interesting thing because I was just thinking, the, so the, the internet network that we were talking about, the mesh network that's powered by a cryptocurrency token, uh, what that will look like in the practice is say that I'm really close to the internet pipe and then I'll basically have my node, my Wi-Fi router, and then I'll beam internet out to these other people around in the property or around the town. And then I'll get paid automatically for how much they're using the internet. And then they will then also spread that internet out to another layer. And then I will also get paid for that internet as well. And then it's like, so, and then each person who adds, adds the network also, and it's all done automatically. So, and in, in, I guess in a sense, PayPal gets a automatic uh, transaction fee, but I imagine the fees are going to be lower. Um, what do you think? I really love the newer business model. I think incentivizing folks are awesome. 
I've made make a lot of like augmented reality filter, but I I don't get paid, and and uh, I'm pretty sure Instagram or Facebook are using it to, for ads and other stuff, and to retain their user base and to compete with other giants. Those are a lot of work. Would it be nice to, if everyone gets paid so that the the income or incentive or, mm. or ROI is redistributed? If, if we had to pay individually for Facebook, because it seems like what you just mentioned made me think about how Facebook is essentially using a lot of people so that, because they're creating content. Yeah. So I go on Facebook, I'm creating content. I'm, I guess, you know, okay, so I'll, I'll give in a scenario. So I go on, I have a party coming up and I write on Facebook, I'm going to write this long thing inviting people to this party in a way that doesn't get trapped by the censors of Facebook. And so Facebook is providing me a value in reaching those people from the party, but it's also extracting a lot of value from me writing on Facebook and essentially them getting more time spent by the listeners to, to see that on Facebook. So th this leads to me the question, like how much would we pay as individuals to use Facebook? Oh, interesting. As as content creators, content creators should be the ones getting paid for their, their content, but then people who are just reading that content should be getting paid. And that's the traditional advertising or the traditional subscription model. But in a, in a, it seems very abstract at the moment, but it does feel like we're moving there. Yeah, I think there's a few companies who are doing that, and I'm really excited about it. I feel like there's animal farms as well. I think it's kind of important that we don't we just really look at the next generation of technology by the business model itself, that we do dil diligence on the, f on the founders. We just want to make sure that the founders are also believers and have the ethos of what they're creating. And, and, and it's because I think there's a lot of founders from the previous generation of the internet who have beliefs that exploit, they believe in surveillance, they believe in exploiting. Then they're taking advantage of the time to create technology that might sound that is generation two or nice with keywords. However, I really get to know them. They're not, they don't pay people. They don't believe in women. They don't believe in freedom. They believe in little spying technology. And, and I think it's important that the community do a lot of due diligence when they not only invest, but also check out the technology. Well, and this gets into an interesting question that I've, I've asked before is, how much how much influence do founders have over the future trajectory of their company because i think i think zuckerberg had some influence but i don't think zuckerberg was able to play out and map the entire history of facebook in 2006 and 2007 and i'm this it, it makes me wonder about how much when we start something how much control particularly once it grows really big how much control or influence can we have over that thing and does it be, have, take on a life of its, of its own I think it's both, right? I think there are certain things that we cannot control or founders cannot control. They make it lucky. It might be timing as well, right? Like LinkedIn, I remember that before the, the tech bust, they weren't doing that well. But after the bust, LinkedIn did particularly well because people kind of found out that they need each other. Timing plays a big part of it, right? I mean, when Facebook started, literally it was a dating site. It came with a bunch of lawsuits. Also, they grew it by a lot of widgets. Can someone create Facebook today? Sure they can. It's basically just linking everyone's web pages together, right? I created web page before, my own web page. And if I look at the first web page that I created, it just looks like Facebook today. But what it wasn't is not connected to you or someone else. So I think timing plays a big part of it. Mm -hmm. But I think founders, even if they grew, have a say in the direction of it. For example, can Mark tell people to take out content that might be harmful? Sure he could. Is it political? Probably, because he probably have a relationship with certain people. So it's really hard because you have your user base, you have people who pay for ads, you have certain people in power that you may need to please. Mm. So as a leader, how do you handle those? And then also grow the you have loss. <laughs> yeah, this is the craziest thing about the last era, which I think is now ended, which is the, the grow at any cost. Don't question the growth, just grow. Uh, because if you grow, if you continue to grow and grow and grow, 
then you'll have investors and you'll never die. And you'll reach this, this you'll reach this point at which the business itself can't be destroyed. Um, and also creates a thing of its life of its own. And I think we're now on the cusp of something new. And I think it has a lot to, more to do with de decentralization. It might get really difficult and challenging over the next three to four years as we kind of make the shift over to whatever is coming next. But um, I do, it might get really challenging and, and really painful because it's like the, 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 it's like, it's like a battle between an older or a younger generation who's grown up with the internet and an older generation who doesn't know how to use the internet. And it's just like completely blindsided by this technology. Um, I don't really have a point here. I'm just going into off into abstract. Yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking about my nephew and a niece. They sent me the latest app that they like, literally. <laughs> it's talking about digital creation in June, Prime Month. June 1st, my niece is like, Prime Month, here's a post already. They are on top of things. <laughs> Oh, is TikTok going to ba be banned in the U.S. next morning? Michelle, I heard that TikTok may be banned <laughs> in the U.S. These are third, I mean, he's in third grade. <laughs> and I think my niece is 10 years old. <laughs> it's crazy. And then, you know, and then you can look into a world where Neuralink, for those of us, those who don't know, Neuralink is a way of actually uh, influencing the neurons to uh, create a computer uh, interface with your, with your, with your neuron, neurons themselves. Uh, and that's like, and then you, and then you look at, you know, I got a nephew who's eight years old, does the same thing. And it's like, it's, they're, they're going to be connected in a degree that will ser make us seriously question what a human being is uh, and w where the line between a human being and computers and um, which I think is going to get really weird, really, really weird. I, I think, I think not only that, mm. not only the relationship between a, a computer and a human, but also different dimensions of the human. Mm -hmm. So you have the subconscious, you have the normal self, and you have the superconscious. Just really different dimensions of the human. And I'm hoping that technology will help us. Well, that's one of my vision. Mm -hmm. That it will help us judge better because I think there's a lot of things that our subconscious pick up, as described by Joan, picked up that we, the outer being, doesn't. For example, if I, if I go and talk to someone and that person is lying, I, M Michelle, might not recognize that, but another part of me may. Mm, yep. And I may not pick up the nuance until later. My subconscious might, usually it happens, it tells me later. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's just really that, that relationship with, with the subconscious mind. Like, I would get insight you know I, I used to be able to write things in my sleep and then I, I basically just need to transcribe it like Michelle transcribe it while the other <laughs> Michelle basically have given me the answer or that through the question for me already so I'm just really interested in how technology could tap into that superpowers and I know that a lot of high-tech companies and the CIA have been kind of looking to that I think that will be really interesting yeah and, and, and I love it because you're you you have an optimistic take on the technology itself but then I always go I, I always <laughs> go the, the geo geopolitics of it and the geopolitics as you just mentioned the CIA taking control and being at the forefront of creating new technologies because military is usually the, the where new technologies are created and 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 it's just a very op the huge opportunity for mental health and like the craziest thing i've learned over the last two years as i've been investigating this stress and creativity question is trauma like the 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 you, you mentioned consciousness we have this consciousness even within our individuals where there's this part of me that is aware of these things happening and there are these other parts that are uh, aware but don't have verbal capacity the same thing goes on in a human being as well that we have a collective conscious that's being moved and swayed um by various things it's going to get the 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 military is going to have a big say into what happens for a lot of those technologies in China, it's already happening. Obviously, in the United States, it's already happening as well. But like, once we link our consciousness to a computer, the 
like the psychological warfare that's already going on with Russia and, and attacking the United States, the nervous system of the United States through bots, like that is going to get really, really scary, but then also really, really beautiful and may help us figure out a lot. Oh yes, the trauma, sorry. I figured out the, 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 the so that trauma, we've only become realized uh, that there is trauma in the last 10 years. Like, life was traumatic. I mean, Buddha talked about life is suffering a long time ago. And that's, that's like the whole thing is set up for suffering. Uh, and then, but there is an end to suffering as well. So it was talked about then, but this new kind of trauma model is so interesting because now we've got like physiological understanding of what's happening to the nervous system under trauma. Uh, but then it's also going to become a problem because people are starting the, the, it can lead into a victimhood mentality of always looking at the things from the trauma viewpoint basically as well. So it's just really interesting. I just threw a lot out there. Usually I don't get that, that, uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, with, with, with trauma though, sometimes the conscious part of you, mm -hmm. when it's too dramatic, don't recognize it and it gets suppressed mm -hmm. with a lot of, people who have gone through little trauma and you get suppressed, you, you forget how technology could help you remember if you want to. In a sense, we already have that technology in our, in our, in our, in the, what's called what John Ruvecki calls psychotechnologies. So we already have these program, these, these processes, these techniques, these, these theories about how to access those memories or access. And it's not really the memory either because the memory particularly the verbal aspects of the memory aren't actually tied to the thing. They're tied to the emotion that is stuck in the body. Mm -hmm. And like if the more that we get to that emotion and really feel the emotion without the story, the more we can move through these, these traumas and like get over things that people tell you. Cause I've, I've been told you, you won't get over the things that have happened to you, but yeah. I'm getting over them. And that's the craziest thing. Cause we already have a lot of technologies to do that. But I think you're right that, there will be a lot of technologies that will add to that already big list of technologies. But I think it's also attitude as well. Yeah. How do you feel about, because when we talk about trauma, there's always that wilderness of one person, because I think a lot of people are afraid of feeling, it's just that feeling, you know, for example, if you go through a divorce, you might be hurt. But instead of feeling that hurt, we do other things. Someone could go shopping, they might go gambling or they might go working a lot or eating a lot or being on the internet or watching porn and just really in there's that holds and most people are afraid of confrontation and communication and that feeling and i feel like there's a lot of resources and there's a lot of technology but mm, people yeah. aren't really like a lot of people feeling it. yeah because of the, the that fear of it as well crying is perceived to be negative and weak but in order to move on or resolve items i just feel like facing that fear that having that feeling of hurt is essential to moving on and to growing and it's it, you're absolutely right that that on uh the and it's recently been happening to me where i've been um the that thing you were talking about that fear yeah. I've, I've now been looking into it uh in a way that's allowing me to pass through it and it's not the thing that i was feared of, afraid of it's like none of it none of the things that are afraid of actually ended up happening mm -hmm. but anytime i have an, and i have another friend who's going through something similar and he's at the point where he still can't look at it he can't look at the fear he can't look at it because it's so overwhelming mm -hmm. and there's no way that i can communicate to him don't worry. It's like, it's, it's all good. Like, like, yes, there is suffering. All this stuff is painful. It is really intense, but you can look at it. You can totally look at it. It might actually lead to this wonderful life if you look at it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it's always dependent on the timing and that person's journey. I think sometimes certain people are really hard on people who go through traumatic times, whether it's a divorce or discovery or something painful because the, people are kind of judgmental. But sometimes it takes time for that person to finally come in terms with what they've went through. And I think it's really difficult to say, 
oh, just let go. Because sometimes people just really need their time to learn that lesson. And sometimes if you don't learn it though, it kind of repeats. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Until you learn it. So, you, you know what I mean? And is that really that willingness to learn and, and to, and, and it's very dependent. Like sometimes when I'm talking to someone and depending on that person and how they want to learn or want to grow or want to change, sometimes it's like, I just let it be because then it's really not, it may not be timing yet. Mm -hmm. It's true. The thing you mentioned about, the thing you mentioned about um, how it repeats itself, that reminds me why they call it the wheel of, I think it's the wheel of dukkha or dharma. It's like, it's in a wheel uh, and it's just constantly coming back in the same way, basically. And then it's like, if I look at the thing, the more I'm willing to look at that fear and look at like all the negative emotion trapped inside my body, the more, the quicker it passes and the quicker the, the cycle start like dissolves and stuff like that. Uh, but it's really, uh, but then a new bigger wave comes in all the time. And then like the bigger wave is really intense. <laughs> Yeah, but like once you learn the lesson, then it goes away though. It's, yeah. it's, it's interesting. <laughs> I'm, I'm more like, oh my God, I just want to learn it and then like just go away. <laughs> oh, go away, I don't want it anymore. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and then you look at the things, you know, the, all the challenging things that humanity is dealing with right now and that it's going to continue to deal with. It's like, whoa. And I think that leads to it because I think you know, we have this trauma model. We didn't really have the trauma model 40 years ago. You couldn't really go to a doctor and say, oh, you know, there, there's physical trauma, but then there's also this emotional trauma that's happening as well. And that is interacting with the nervous system in ways that we don't fully understand yet. Actually, and we do understand a lot of it, but it's not widely disseminated. Vessel van der Kolk uh, in his body, Body That Keeps the Score, in his book, Body Keeps the Score, is really good to read about this. But like, that's a thing now. And the COVID-19, has been a traumatic experience for a lot of people and most people you know it took me seven or eight years of doing all this stuff to finally figure out that there is a model for post-traumatic resilience or post-traumatic growth and a lot of people understand that without n needing to know about the model and they just do it but we, but we can also like get this out there that like there's been a huge traumatic event it's not over by any means of the, the 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 thing but your our nervous systems have been uh, are essentially acting out of fear because of this great giant fear emotion that's swept through the collective consciousness um, and and it's traumatic and we need to like I, I guess we can't do anything because it's like up to each individual to to figure out their own relationship to what's happened but I, think but, but I also feel like I think when it first happened, I have a lot of friends who reach out because I, I read a lot of Brene Brown in the past. I think her her books, uh, The Gift of Imperfection, and a few of other books are are pretty good. It talks about sh the 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 relationship between shame mm -hmm. and back acting. You could do something bad, but that's that's not a character judgment. And how to embrace yourself, even though you're imperfect. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of folks who are, you know, I think that's one of the reasons when someone is, is into, I think when we judge people, when we label people, and, and in the internet where everything is permanent, even chatbots, <laughs> when we create avatar of ourselves, we do not allow each individual to change. And we don't allow for redemption because it's always there. How could we judge and how do we shame people if we ourselves is not perfect. It really talks and tells a lot about our self-acceptance and self-love. I really love her book. And I think during, during the time, there's really a lot of people who are really reading about resilience because I think we, we want a lot of that. And I think it's just really something that culture, when we're, I think like before in social media, I remember one of my nephew has crooked teeth and it, like, and he's brave. He'll be on YouTube, and people will make fun of his teeth. Mm. And it's just really that resilience that we need, right? Because there's a lot of people who bully, and there's people who judge. And it's really when you don't really care about what people say about you <laughs> that you start to live. <laughs> and that's yeah, yeah, that's that's absolutely right. And and it's 
we've it takes so much courage and and like so our brains were designed to live within the tribes of less than 150 people uh, that's the way that our brain was designed by evolution not designed was evolved due to evolution and so our brain is that way and then only in the last 4,000 years have we started to live in cities and in cities we interact with strangers mm -hmm. and most strangers you can you can trust like you can probably go out the street and eight out of those 10 strangers would probably give you your money back would do all these things mm -hmm. but then there are these two out of the 10 strangers who are crazy uh or psychopathic or 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 just like dangerous uh and and those people are loud uh and they yell and they bully uh and that bullying is so effective that a lot of the other people kind of shut up and then you have china and russia coming in and, and <laughs> there's also bullies for i, I think <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah i think if you i read a lot of the like the sociopath next door manipul manipulation of the tactics that sociopaths and psychopaths use having having met psychopaths and sociopaths myself i wanted to say <laughs> that there are bullies who are not who are not bluntly who don't bluntly bully you there mm -hmm. could be ones that are really silent about it they were very manipulative that you don't know and they use a lot of reverse psychology sympathy and empathy is really one of the ways so if someone comes to me and the first thing they say is they want your empathy usually i don't want to work with them because i know that <laughs> it's Love bombing is one of the it's one of the way it's, it's one of the way that I think cults and the, the mind control people like if you study mind control there's really different methods you know there's mind control there's environment control it, it's very interesting because like you see very possessive relationships they don't let you see other people that's environment control they give you flowers and stuff that's love bombing there's the opposite of that as well yeah, you can, but you can give flowers without love bombing and you can, you can yes. do all these things. And that's the craziest thing because they, the, 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 the people you're talking about basically use the same, the concepts of the thing and know how to manipulate the concept. But as you said, you have a, you have a thing inside of your body that tells you afterwards, like, oh, this is happening. And, and, and that's actually something really interesting that comes from Sapolsky, Robert Sapolsky. He wrote this book called Behave there's the amygdala and the amygdala is where the fear center it's like the network of fear in the brain um, and fear is a really important tool because it helps us to keep away from danger and, uh, and but there's a part the central amygdala is the amygdala that is innate fears but then there's this outer part of the amygdala that is fears that we learn over time mm -hmm. um, and we actually have to learn how to distrust strangers if you, a baby will trust strangers and so we actually need to learn that. And that's because of the stranger thing, er, the cities and strangers and living around strangers. Um, but, and, but I think it comes through, you've, you've dealt with sociopaths. I've, I know that you, what you said is accurate because I've also dealt with sociopaths <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, and they're sneaky and quick, but I guess you have to experience them to understand emotionally and experientially that it does happen. Um, and until you've experienced it, and now everybody gets to experience it with, with the social media. So Maybe we'll learn. Maybe we'll learn as a collective to, to do it. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's good. I mean, sometimes bad experiences are good. <laughs> I mean, I know it sounds kind of crazy and it's hard, but until you have, for the people in the startup world, right, until they find someone or work with someone who is crazy, <laughs> they, they won't be more mindful, aware next time. You could be gullible, but how many times do you, do you, are you, would you be gullible? I mean, I, I think, and, and then once, and then if you meet someone who's similar, then you'll recognize the sign. So I think yeah. growth is good because whatever, like if you meet, for example, if you meet person. a social path for one month, yeah. in one month, that's your lesson yeah. for life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. As long as long as the encounter with the sociopath or psychopath is not fatal, and this is what uh, Nassim Taleb talks about, he's like, the best way to innovate is to get yourself into really, really deep trouble, but as long as the trouble isn't fatal, as long as it doesn't kill you, <laughs> you can pull yourself out of this, out of this, this. That's how you're going to innovate because it's like you have to get it, you have to do it. Yeah, and that, I, I definitely had a learning experience like that with the psychopath, and it was. It was really challenging, but now I know he explained to me how they work. So uh, he explained to me how he works. So, and then- There's usually a pattern to the social path. You'll pick it up. I am very sensitive, kind of, like even though 
I'm not. So it's kind of weird. Well, I'll the- talk to someone and they'll tell me something. And then I'll be in another situation with that person and he'll say something and I'll pick pick something. I'm like, okay, something is wrong. You'll pick up patterns. Sometimes someone meets somebody, they'll they'll like not hang out with them again. But you know, sometimes when you hang out with that person again, and I, I think it's not judgment because I think there's a difference between, I normally don't judge people because that's not who I am. I'm just too busy to do that. <laughs> and I have just so many, so much life that I, think, I don't really care. But I think, but I think, I think there's red flags and I care about that. And then, you know, then I basically move on from that. Mm-hmm. I think you're not judgmental and I can feel that, but I think you are discerning. Yeah. Um, so you're able to, 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 and that's how you find red flags is, is discernment is how you find red flags. So, um, yeah. Yeah. This is, this has been fun. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, is, is there anything else that you wanted to discuss or chat about? There's one thing, but uh well, I don't know if, if anybody is, has really enjoyed uh, listening to my podcast or listening to this conversation. They should check out my podcast, Crazy Wisdom. Um, Crazy Wisdom is a... Where is it on? Uh, it's on iTunes and Spotify and Stitcher. Uh, you can just search for Crazy Wisdom. Um, and it's, uh, I've, been, I've been really liking Spotify as a podcast hosting platform these days because uh, Spotify, you can, um, they keep backlinks. So if you host a podcast on iTunes after you publish 50 episodes all the other episodes are deleted from their database but Spotify keeps them up so you can listen to the whole thing oh, so, awesome. mm-hmm. I have I think my podcast is on Spotify as well but I haven't mm-hmm. really paid much attention to it just because like sometimes I focus on meeting cool people yeah. and yeah. not necessarily the the tech behind it cool I think I'm subscribed to you I'll check and what is that one wisdom that you wanted to share with the community? Okay, let's go into it. So I've been listening to this lecture series by John Verveke, uh, Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. And he actually takes 50 hours to establish what does wisdom even mean? Uh, and so wisdom has something, it doesn't really have anything to do with intelligence, but it has a lot to do with discernment. And it has a lot of to do with the realization, relevance, realization. So like, I'm, my eyesight is giving me a whole bunch of information right now. But right now I'm focused on this conversation. That's what's relevant. Um, And there's like millions of things that are going into my thing. So like the ability to realize relevance is a key part of wisdom. And so in order to find wisdom, traditionally in times past, we would essentially be in a wisdom tradition that was like part of this tribe. We don't really have that anymore. Um, we Science destroyed it, science killed it. Um, and now, so we need a new wisdom tradition. We've got the older ones, but sometimes those older wisdom traditions, they went through a dark age. Well, humanity went through a dark age and then refound these things, but then applied them in a way that didn't have the wisdom. And wisdom is an embodied thing. So it's an experiential thing that you, that you learn through life. Uh, and so I would find a community but you don't want to find a community that's run by a sociopath unless you need to learn that lesson. Then you want to do that. But if you don't need to learn that lesson, go find a community of people who are, have similar questions and are asking them in a way that does not make it look like they're sociopaths. Um, and uh, yeah, and so that's biggest advice is figure out how to find the equivalent of a wisdom tradition uh, to embed yourself in for some time period to give you some context on what's going on. How do you, how do you grow wisdom? That's a good question. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think it's I think it's through life, but some people have wisdom when they're really young. Uh, um, so I think a lot of these practices, I think flow has to do with it, uh, cultivating flow. So finding those practices that you enjoy so much that you can enter a state of timeless wonder. Uh, and then prajna. Prajna is a word from Buddhism that means scaling up. So identifying with the whole universe as you, and then also scaling down your attention so you can focus your attention on your breath. I think that is really important. I think sati, sati or, or mindfulness is really important. And I think those things can start to lead to the process that uh, betters wisdom, makes wisdom easier, better. Awesome. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye.